Thanks for being here with me. You know, folks, something that I've told you many times before, and I know I probably sound like a bit of a broken record on this, is that uh, Canada's access to information laws are terrible. Our, our transparency is awful. We Every four years, a new, a new federal government comes in and promises they're going to fix it. And then four years later, nothing has happened. If anything, it's gotten worse. There is an incentive uh, imbalance here. The guys who are currently in power have no incentive to make it easier to hold their feet to the fire, while the opposition, of course, has every incentive to promise that once they're in power, they'll make it easier to find out what the guys in power have been doing. I have always said that the United States has a better access to information system than we do, and how for a Canadian journalist calling up any random American department at a federal or a state level is just this really depressing experience, because you get a sense of how it could be a lot better here. I was interested to read at the R Street Institute an article that was talking about making the U.S. system even better. Anthony Markham uh, is a resident fellow for governance at the R Street Institute, and he joins me here now. Anthony, I'm going to let you explain your own article here, but let me tell you an example of uh, something I ran into a couple of years ago. I was trying to figure out um, the the status of a court case uh, where an individual had been charged with a crime, a violent crime, and I just all I wanted was basically an update on what the latest uh, was, and. I, you know, I emailed the guy's lawyer. He got right back to me and said, we're not commenting on the case. I emailed the, uh, the prosecutors. They also said they weren't commenting. So I, I just had to uh, think to myself, how could I figure out what the status is? And the ultimate answer was, was that I could drive three hours to the courthouse, access the physical document and photocopy it for 25 cents a page if I wanted I didn't really want to drive three hours each way that day. So I never ended up figuring it out. In the U.S., you were making, uh, you were writing about a proposal that would take a, an, an information system that is already better than what we have and make it even better still. That, that's right. And the article you referenced, and thank you for mentioning, I appreciate it. In the United States, we have something called the Public Access to Court Electronic Record System, PACER for short. And what that is is the federal judiciary runs an online system for any federal court records. And those public court records, people can log in, you have to register, and you can access those files. The problem is, it's a paywall. Generally, the federal judiciary will charge $0.10 cents per page. So as you can imagine, legal pleadings are generally not very short, and so those costs add up. And so one of the things that I, along with many others, have been pushing Congress to do for some time is to make these documents free and accessible. And on this PACER system was created in the 90s. It's woefully outdated. There are a number of problems. It's difficult to search. Also, it's important to modernize this system as well. Not only it's, it would help for researchers. It would help for small companies who can't afford to look at this information. You can think of the West laws and the Lexus Nexus of the world that take this information, reformat it, and sell it as legal research tools. Only the big guys can do this. This would actually help small companies make legal research more affordable and accessible and help a number of people across a number of different instances. And, you know, I mean, obviously guys like me, journalists reporting on a story, would, would benefit from that. But there's a really important fundamental access to justice issue here. It would also help people who were fighting for their lives and were doing so on a, on a shoestring. That's right. You know, Often in the United States, when we talk about the federal courts, we talk about the really politically contentious cases. Right now, we're talking about efforts by the Trump administration to sue in different federal courts around the country to try to contest certain state elections. So really, you know, the vast majority of federal cases are maybe someone trying to save their business, someone suing for discrimination, someone trying to get some sort of social security benefit for themselves. And those are the types of cases Having access to information at an affordable rate is incredibly important. One instance I always think about are federal prisoners who are trying to um, trying to uh, raise claims to say maybe their prison sentence was unfair, their conditions are improper. The best type of research is to look at the pleadings that worked in the past, and you can't you can't afford that. And so that's that's the type of thing that I always think about. And of course, one notable thing for Pacer. You know, often the federal courts will say, well, sometimes we'll waive fees. Actually, it's in the law and in their policy. They will not waive for media, which is one of the more frustrating parts about the current policy. 
And that is interesting, right? Because even even though, um, look, dropping a few bucks on some court filings would be annoying for a journalist, but it would be something that would benefit more than just the journalist, right? It could raise public awareness of an issue that could potentially push politicians into action. It could get people, lawyers, communicating who might not have realized there were other cases like that here. I mean, the free exchange of information is how a free society works. Exactly. And, of course, you can think of the larger media companies. The New York Times and the Washington Post can afford large pacer fees, maybe tens of thousands of dollars a year. But your local journalist, your local media outlet just simply cannot afford that. And so I think a lot of things slip by that um, shouldn't if people would have actually free access to this court information. What is the the argument almost against this? And you'd mentioned that the system is outdated. Is this just an example of no one actually per se would defend the current status quo, but it's just been around for a while and no one's gotten around to fixing it yet? So there are a couple arguments against it. One about the outdated, I think it's commonly accepted that the PACER system needs to be modernized. The big question is how to do it. The Administrative Office of U.S. Courts, which is the policymaking body for the federal judiciary in the U.S., has been trying to make steps to this. Usually um, advocates for modernizing PACER argue that this process has gone um, too slowly and it hasn't been effective. On the other side, one thing the administrative office has been pushing quite heavily is against this proposal that um, to make PACER free. And one of the arguments saying it's going to hurt their budget. And actually, PACER is a great money-making system for the federal courts, about $150 million a year by having a paywall for public court records. They're obviously concerned about this going away. So one of the big negotiations currently with Congress is to look at ways to pay for this system, how to come up with creative methods to so the judiciary doesn't actually have a significant dent on their budget. But at the end of it, from the federal court's perspective, money is the big factor here, why they're fighting against it. And that, I mean, that's that's interesting. I mean, the, the amount of money that it would be at that level is going to be relatively uh, insignificant compared to the guy, as we'd said, who's fighting to defend his business and every buck counts, and the difference between victory or defeat might be a couple of hundred bucks. I mean, small amounts make a big difference at the bottom. Huge amounts, relatively speaking, don't make that much difference at the top. That's right, and I think that's one of the big frustrations and one of the big disconnects as well. When and Recently, I think it should be noted, last night, the U.S. House of Representatives actually passed um, something called the Open Courts Act of 2020, which in part would make in, would make PACER free and modernize the entire court system. This was done by voice vote, meaning that there was no actual objection in the House of Representatives, which is a huge step. Something like this has never um, gotten this far in Congress. So there's a lot of momentum and a lot of excitement. And finally, Congress is starting to notice this. And this might not be law by the end of the current Congress, which ends in January, but this is something that more and more law and policymakers are looking towards as more and more people keep talking about this system. So I remain cautiously optimistic that hopefully something will change um, sooner rather than later. In terms of uh, the, the, the possible changes here, I mean, obviously there's a, a political transition happening in the U.S. right now. How confident are we that we could see some movement on this maybe early in the new Congress? Well, I'm, again, I'm hopeful. And one of the nice things about this type of legislation is, is that it has remained bipartisan throughout the entire process. Um, the, the bill that I mentioned that just passed the House of Representatives, it was sponsored by both um, a Democrat and a Republican. There is a similar version on the Senate side that's, again, co-sponsored by two Democrats and two Republicans. So um, staff and lawmakers from both sides of the aisle have focused on this issue and have worked together on it. I think, in my mind, it's one of the few bipartisan successes that we've seen in Congress. When uh, One kind of more big-picture question for you here. What in general, and again, this is even as a Canadian looking at this with, with uh, envy, your, your bad system that you want to see replaced would be light years ahead of our current system. But in terms of, of the, the political demands to choose this, you've mentioned it's bipartisan here. What do you think it is that allows this kind of an issue to be bipartisan in the United States? And there's been so much interesting talk in recent years of criminal uh, justice reform in the United States. And I understand that PACER is not just cr criminal matters. It, it's broader than that. 
But there's been a real bipartisan interest on this, uh, the, this and related matters in the United States in recent years, which I think is good and I think is interesting. I'm just wondering what you think brought it about, because this has been kind of a change of pace or even just a change in tone in recent years. I think it's a good thing that these things are being looked at, but I'm wondering why you think it is, as you noted, it was rare that this legislation remained bipartisan. What is it about this issue that would normally maybe cut against the grain a bit, particularly of, for the Republicans? Why is this an issue you are able to build a bipartisan consensus? I think it's a couple of things. One, it does help that it's one of those issues that's kind of in the weeds. It's obviously not going to be on the 7 o'clock evening news. So I think that definitely helps, and there's not this sense of left-right conflict associated with that. In addition, people have worked a long time on this issue. This current legislative effort has been over five years from outside groups, scholars, academics, working with different policymakers on the Hill to discuss this topic. And I think last and probably most importantly, the way to sell this issue and the way to explain this issue and understand your audiences and explain why maybe someone who's more conservative, why the conservative case for this issue of being small businesses will be able to compete. These legal startups can create free and affordable tools to ultimately, ultimately make legal research better, more affordable, easier to do. Maybe for other audiences, explain why this is detrimental for people who are trying to get benefits, the little guy who's trying to fight their case in federal court, explaining how to convey those messages and why that everyone has the same goal is a really effective way to get bipartisan legislation done. Well said. Hey, I really appreciate your time. It was a fascinating article. Great conversation. Thanks so much for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it.